Hi, and welcome. Josh is a visionary media executive. He has made a significant impact, a uh, significant impact. What am I talking about? I mean, he's redefined uh, television, particularly cable television. He made three of the five best shows of all time and four of the top eight shows of all time. We'll get into what those are. Uh, Chief Executive Officer and President of AMC Networks, uh, a role that he just completed after 30 plus years. He's a driving force behind uh, the success of the most iconic TV brands of all time, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, Better Call Saul, and maybe the most culturally significant show, certainly of my lifetime, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. His track record of success and innovation has cemented his place as one of the most influential executives in TV today. He's also the author of four books, the most recent one called The Third Act, Reinventing Your Next Chapter. Uh, and, and this is why we're really, really, really thrilled to have him here today, is that uh, he is a board member of People for the American Way, where he has been a member of the board now for 26 um, years. A, a good number. A good number. I think two or three more years and we'll know um, that you're committed. So uh, here's, here's what I want to uh, ask. You know, this book, it's got, it's about about 60 people. There are incredible portraits of people who um, are moving into their third act. Uh, it's a meditation on aging uh, and discovery, on accomplishment, and on, on persistence. And it's all about a new way to do your third act. It includes, you know, a lot of people that we know, uh, some people that we don't, and some people that you and I know very well through their servants on, on People for the American Way, including our very own founder, Norman Lear, who now at 100 years old has shown no signs of slowing down, and Dolores Huerta in her mid-90s that none of us can can keep up with. Um, really thrilled to talk about this book, but I have like all these burning questions that I want to get to first. Well, first of which is Breaking Bad, Mad Men, Better Call Saul, and The Walking Dead, four of the best eight TV shows ever created. Well, how would you round out the rest of that list? Sure. What are your favorite TV shows all time? Well, first, thank you so much for having me. And and I just did want to interject one thing. If there's, if there's a godfather of the intersection of politics and popular culture, it is Norman Lear. At a time when no one was doing on television, then considered really not a progressive medium, actually a regressive medium. He was doing shows that were not only incredibly appealing, obviously, and extraordinarily popular and winning in the ratings of then broadcast television, but they were, they were just so important about politics as described in the home. And, and really, when I say he's the godfather, he really wrote the book on how that happens in the medium of television. And so really, uh, if there's a list of the 10 best TV shows, there's a list of only one of the godfather of people who made this medium one that has social impact in a way that is, you know, I would call it profound. You could use the word insidious, but it is so pervasive <laughs> that it really does affect people's lives. And that's Norman Lear. And he's happily uh, on the right hand top of the book because uh, I think he's on his, I don't know how many acts. It's tough to count. <laughs> Yeah, if you count World War, if you count being raised in the Depression, serving in World War II, that's two acts right there. I mean, he was writing on some of the, I mean, the, the, the list of shows just boggles the mind that he wrote on before even moving to, I think it was his fifth act by the time he moved to L.A. Yeah. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, the Jeffersons, Maude, uh, all those shows, and then All in the Family, which is the really the, the crown jewel of exactly what you're describing. Yeah. Now, of course, he actually has a production company called Act 3 Productions, where he still produces. Right. In the course of both of, of your career, but in the course of writing this book, what would you say you learned most from Norman? You know, um, you, I think, Santi, you have been exposed to Norman widely. And, you know, I just was by someone we both know, uh, I was reminded when he said uh, two words about something he said over next and uh, over next. And it was meant, and I think it embodies um, many things that may be relevant to the book, but just that are so important to life and to Norman and, and <clears throat> to progress, uh, which is a word, just if I say it conveniently, in progressive. And that is get on with it. 
So many stories here. I mean, obviously people that we, we know quite well, like Jane Fonda, um, what is a, an anecdote from this book that was surprising? Maybe somebody that's not a household name. Sure. Yeah. You know, I can go on and on. You know, there, there are there's a dozen or so people among the 60 who are sort of household names. And and because of my work, which was in the entertainment related business, I, I knew them. So I had, frankly, the opportunity to ask them and and maybe they just out of guilt said yes. But, um, but by the way, but, if I could have been a fly on the wall for the Robert Redford discussion. Yeah, you know, he's something else. He began as a painter and then did New York theater, live theater on stage wow. and then went into the movies and then uh, really. Had some small was, success there, yeah. Yeah, had some small success there. But for love of independent film and artistry, created mm -hmm. the Sundance Institute, which people know less about than the Sundance Film Festival, which supports mm -hmm. the Institute. And the Institute mm -hmm. really gives craft and instruction to new filmmakers and mm -hmm. the festival supports that and along the way became probably maybe under acknowledged one of the most important environmentalists of our time and well before the word environmentalist was in common usage and you know he just is in in that sense i think perhaps undercredited and overshadowed uh, because of being a movie star, you know, and, and it's curious in, in one of his movies, it's interesting. Um, um, uh, is it the way we were? He's has a romance with Barbara Streisand, if I'm not mistaken. And there's a voiceover and the voiceover says words to the effect, or someone says it, that, um, he was sort of taken for granted or undercredited because things look easy for him. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I'm, I'm getting it half right, but it's just interesting. That's a life fully lived with enormous impact. But I will try and answer your question, which is there are many people in the book, 50 or so, that you've never heard of. And, um, and, they, and, and they have lived their lives in a way that, that is so to be admired by me. Um, and I'll name a few examples because it's better than saying words, which is, there's a woman named Hope Hartley who worked at Verizon all of her life. She grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and attended the Brooklyn Children's Museum and was uh, liked it a lot. And then after her work at Verizon, after lots of toil, opened the Bronx Children's Museum, a borough that doesn't see that sort of support. By the way, I'm going to tell you an anecdote that's sort of funny. So I was uh, sort of talking about the book and and pushing it and uh, you know as one does and yeah. i was with Ho partly and we went to the room afterwards when we when the cameras were on and and i said to her gee you're really really good on television apart from opening yeah. uh the bronx and she said well when i retired i also started to take acting lessons and yeah. i've been doing summer stock and traveling the country every summer and doing theater and then I went home and my wife said, yeah, she's in two commercials that are running, as we say, in heavy rotation right now. Um, wow. So uh, that's that's an awful lot. Can you tell me about Andrea Peterson. This is a story that knocked my socks off. The unlikely at 50 years old. Well, I don't want to step on it, but. Uh, no, you don't. You go ahead, because I'd like to hear your interpretation of it. Then I'll add to it. Do you mind? Well, I, you know, somebody who had this experience as a young person, and I think like a lot of us go, okay, well, I need to have a career and a normal career and I need to do, but was still so touched by it that she wanted to go back and help other people. She became at 50 years old, uh, EMS and firefighter. Did you, did you catch in her bio, Svante, that she was also, uh, maybe it just makes for good narrative, but it's true that hmm. she was in a fire as a kid. Yes, and, that's, yeah. Yeah, and so, that that experience like stayed yeah. and maybe and this is what I was wondering. I don't know. If, did she all that time ago think, well, firefighter is not a career for a woman, but I'm so appreciative of what they did for me, and then later come around to it, or, or what? What is it about? I guess all of these people. What's the through yeah. line that you found in talking to? Well, these you people? know, you know, I think if there is a through line, I'll attempt to summarize it. I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sufficiently capable as an anthropologist or sociologist to summarize the through line, but I do think. And, you know, you sort of broadly, I think the people arguably split into two different camps of mm -hmm. third acts, those who have very strong social impact and they really are helping the world. They're moving the stone up the hill. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are those who are realizing what were their 
fantasies or dreams as a guy who was a telephone repairman and then mm. became a successful shoe designer. And Art Schill, a guy who worked in a job and then became a stand-up comedian, uh, close to 80. And so they're more fanciful than they are uh, fixing the world. As a, like Jamal Joseph, who was a Black Panther and mm. was then imprisoned and got two advanced degrees while in prison and be, came out and, and taught both university and then began a theater company. But if they have one thing in common, I guess it's sort of simple. And I'll rhetorically ask anyone near my age who might be happening on this, um, what they think about doing that they haven't done hmm. and w what might touch them e either sentimentally or spiritually or socially. And is it possible hmm. to do some or a bit of it? And I guess the people in the book all did that. They, yeah. They figured out a way to um, marshal themselves and whatever resources were necessary to realize what was, you know, often in the back of, I'll say it collectively, our heads. Yeah. I should do this. I'd like to do that. I had a fantasy of doing that. I think that's sort of universal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's not easy to manifest it. And these people all manifested it. So it was really helpful for me to examine them because I thought, well, get on it, man. Yeah. Uh, there, they are, there they are. And is this, was this a form of not, you know, this is too personal question. Um, feel free to, I remember uh, at Norman's uh, 100th birthday party, I asked him, I said, hi, hey, Norman, how are you feeling? And he said, it's an awfully personal question. But I, don't, I don't think I have to answer that. <laughs> it's still so fun, so sharp as anything. And then teasing. So. But, um, you know, you are younger than the people, or the most of the people in this book. Uh, but are finishing a career, uh, transitioning in a career. They've seen stellar, stellar success. Was this book a form of processing that for you or figuring out, okay, um, I made some of the most important intellectual property of all time, and I still have all of these years ahead of me. What am I supposed to do now? Was this, was this a personal ambition for... Or, was this a personal project, I guess? Oh, yeah, without, without a doubt. I mean, it began, I began by thinking, it, was, it took, you know, these things look like, uh, these books often look like, even though it's a coffee table book, you did it last night, um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, but it took me, you know, four years. Uh, it doesn't, I don't know why it took four years, but it took four <laughs> years. And, um, and so I began to think about what I would do. And I observed friends and colleagues and associates who I thought were doing it either well or remarkably and some not and mm -hmm. some having challenges. And so I began to think about what was in their um, either in their genetics or in their behavior that brought them to a place of, uh, you know, to say it's obviously sort of satisfaction or fulfillment and better even if they had impact in the world, of course. Mm -hmm. And so I began to just, you know, I wouldn't call it a study as in science, but I began to observe them. Mm -hmm. and, and then I ran into, I began as my antenna went up, you know, I um, found, you know, in, in media coverage that was existing, a guy named Carl Butts, who's in the book, mm -hmm. and he was covered on This American Life and his wife had passed away. They were very close. He was just retiring and he thought, what am I going to do? I'm now alone and lonely-ish. And so he bought the smallest circulation newspaper in America. And he's William Randolph Hearst of, <laughs> of the smallest circulation newspaper in America, which is the coolest thing on the planet. And so I'm sure, as he was would say, um, it helped him. But he, he did something that really was worthwhile and had impact on people and was good for his own health. I love that. I almost don't, I almost don't want to know the answer to this next question because it might be more romantic. The answer is that I would like to be the mayor of Ithaca. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I would like to, uh, because this is you, I'd like to actually go to my, ride my bicycle to work. Yeah. And then I would like to be the inventor of America's smallest public park by giving <laughs> up my parking lot, my parking space, to the public, which if anyone doesn't know who's listening or watching, that's Savante Merrick. You did that, and I cannot ever get over the um, the fancy word would be the poetry of it, but just the whimsy and the beauty of it, and also the embodiment of good values. I'm sorry. So that's what I want to be. Well, I don't like the weather in Ithaca, but I'm ready to go. <laughs> that's, well, it's kind of, listen, <clears throat> I can tell you somebody who 10 years uh, is, is mayor are like dog years. So, so I would just say buckle up. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, so I really recommend, but I noticed 
so so in your career, you're obviously you are working in a very creative industry, and you are on the business side, right? You have to make the whole studio work, the whole network work. Um, but it seems like you have such a real actual affection for the creative. I mean, your poetry, and I heard that you have another book of poetry that's coming out soon. Um, and also now your, your, your production of independent films. I mean, is that, am I projecting a little bit here? I might be projecting to say, did you ever feel frustrated in the boardroom thinking to yourself, I want to go hang out with the creative kids. I want to go uh, into the writer's room. <clears throat> I, 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 I didn't because yeah. I, I, I was uh, absolutely clear that I was without adequate talent because I exercised uh, OR. I exercised all my attempts to be an actor and a writer and a producer and a director. And it was crystal clear early on that it was not having me. And so, uh, so that was not a possibility. I, I have great affection for it, but not sufficient capability to mm -hmm. be the doer of it. So um, uh, I was very happy to be uh, sort of counting numbers and figuring out how the business could support the work of people who were doing extraordinary work. And, you know, it was it really was the greatest privilege. I know that sounds like a hackneyed term yeah. to be near people who like Vince Gilligan, who would write Breaking Bad and concoct it and Peter Gould. And then they wrote Better Call Saul and and all the people who created a comic book called The Walking Dead that then went on to embody and i don't know if there's social impact in it but there was great diversity in it oh for sure and there was a lord of the flies lesson almost all the time in yeah. social organization and and so great satisfaction in that not to mention the filmmakers that i got to be anywhere near who who made amazing movies so i was happy to be um in the same school with the cool kids i didn't oh. need to be in the same class well that's that's um that's quite enlightened of you. I had a similar. Experience. I went to to Cornell to be Nicholas Kristoff. That was my. I was gonna, you know, write the wrongs of the world with just the power of my pen. And yeah, it was about sophomore year. My professors let me know, uh, you know, Nicholas Kristoff, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you never will be. Let me just ask this before, yeah. because I really appreciate all all of your time today. I want to ask about what's coming next in the culture, in the media, and in our politics. Because you, you've shown just an ability to see around the corner. You know, we were talking about the difference between the creative folks and the business folks, but you have to have a creative sense in order to approve <clears throat> some of these projects. Now, it might seem like the biggest slam dunk uh, in hindsight, but I read that Mad Men was sitting on a shelf and was, was turned down by... Uh, network after network over the course of years before you approved it. And the same is true, you know, Walking Dead is not an obvious comic book adaptation. Those of us who read the comic book, in fact, weren't quite sure it was going to work. And I still think uh, something that critics understood and that that uh, I, I think should have been an even bigger hit preacher, we should talk about sometime, because I, I thought that was just a masterful adaptation of a fascinating idea. But anyway... You saw around the corner with these shows. Um, what do you see coming next? Is there a particular, is there a form of intellectual property? Or is there a kind of story that you think is just dying to be told? And what do you think that will mean for politics? And I don't want to lead you too much, but no, you know, coming out of obviously the pandemic, all of the, the turmoil from you know, Donald Trump's presidency, and then of course the, the attempted insurrection, and now the country seeming closer and closer to a national divorce, as Marjorie Taylor Greene calls it, closer than any time in you know, the last 150 years. Where do you see this all heading? You know, I, I am not sure that I have the absolutely right answer. It's, I'm gonna babble a bit. Please <clears throat> say, say a few different things for whatever it's worth. One is that um, I think it's not possible to divorce technology from mm -hmm. that dialogue only because it's its impact is so profound mm -hmm. and um and it it it's not in place in sort of movies and television exactly but the you know hbo has a big hit based on a, a video game and yeah. and so is that new shakespeare it sort of is new shakespeare and mm -hmm. so is robert kirkman and the walking dead a bit new shakespeare but by the way 
just because this is going to be an inconclusive answer because Shakespeare, Hamlet, um, is being done on the stage, was done on the stage of the public theater in a play called Fat Ham. That's an all black play that takes place in a black ghetto mm-hmm. and it's moving to Broadway. So that's, that's pretty, so that's, that's some enduring IP. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the one thing that I will just say, just to come full circle in the conversation as it relates to social impact, apart from the real pragmatics of interactivity, game mm-hmm. world, TikTok world short form, which does give birth to many interesting things, is just the potential power of it all. And, you know, I, I was surprised, Savanti, if I may, and I, at least I'll close out my spiel unless you have more time. Yeah, and please. just say that when you mentioned, uh, when you said your shows up front uh, and you listed them, you, you said, da, 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 and then you said, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. And I actually mm-hmm. was surprised when you said it. It took me aback because I thought you were going to say, the Wire or Sopranos or something that tends to make the list yeah. of of the greatest TV shows of all time. And I don't think Queer Eye is on there. But the reason I bring it up, <clears throat> and we did oversee the development of it. We then sold the Bravo cable channel to NBC, who made it heroic. Right. They did a great job with it. But there was a politician from the Midwest at the time who said to me that Queer Eye did more to overcome homophobia Mm-hmm. in Nebraska than any policy work that was done because it um, it it personalized mm-hmm. uh, it personalized gay queer people in a way that was not threatening and was friendly yep. and so in the same way that all in the family did that yep. the and because there is you said it a, a monstrous divide. I guess I yearn for mm. something that um, can make human can bring us together. Human condition that is not immediately about uh, what's different. Well, I love that, and I I could not have said it better myself. I think of that show as so. Queer Eye was. Um, I grew up in Earlville, New York, which is the Nebraska of New York State. Uh, there were eight hundred people, twelve hundred cows. And so we always had to, you know, keep our head on a swivel. And when that show came out, there was still, it it was still not unusual. And I'm just going to name it. Um, A a gay person giving you advice. Well, surely that makes you gay, right? Isn't there some, isn't there some sort of transitive property of gayness that we all must be afraid of and cannot associate ourselves with? And it started to break down. I don't. It, it, it did enormous amounts to break that down and to unite us all as as Americans and show us what the true American way is. So, uh, Walking Dead did the same. I mean, honestly, one of the most ethnically diverse shows on television, not just at the time, but still. And uh, that wasn't the point of the show, right? Michonne was scary because Michonne is scary. And Rick <laughs> was... Um, you are really a fan, Lou. Whoa, you're a oh fan. Oh, my gosh. Oh, she's <laughs> terrific. And her relationship with Rick is not, you know, some interracial friendship in which we all learn a lesson at the end of the... We are just all trying to survive. Yeah. And uh, whether it be a zombie apocalypse or the challenge is coming, that's what we've all got to do. So, I, you know, yeah. You, you, said, you said it. I, I'll say it's truth, justice, and the American way. And um, that's almost the line for Superman. And that's that's what uh, some somewhere the media will accelerate that notion. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, Josh, anything you'd like us to know as we close out? Uh, all, all good. I thank you so much for your time. You are the man. Thank you for everything. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for your long service to people for the American world.